A Farewell Tribute to Open Line's Fred Anderley on the Columbus Collaborative is a production of WOSU Public Media. I'm Neil Conan. I'm at the Battelle Center. At WOSU at COSI, and it's my privilege this evening to be here with a voice you know well, a voice you expected to hear after that music started, the voice of Fred Anderley, who is, as you know, will have, depending on when you hear this broadcast, is about to leave or will have left. 29th of May. On the 29th 29th of May. May. And um, Fred, I wanted to ask you, you've done this job for so long that you may not remember how to answer this question, but... If you had to think about how to prepare someone to be a talk show host, to do two hours every day on the radio, to last all this time, to have all these people put up with you, and not only after all that time, well, listen, but love you, what would you say? I would say uh, avoid the situation if you could. (laughs) (laughs) But if you couldn't, it helps to be obsessive. (laughs) It helps to have a lot of stamina. And it helps to just enjoy a good conversation, just the way we both do. Indeed. And to have an inquiring mind that, that wants to know everything about everybody. Yeah. Does panic play a big part in your life? <laughs> For the first year I did the show, well, I remember walking in the show the first day. I had driven across country August 10th, 1988, in my van from visiting friends in San Francisco. I had driven 14 hours a day. Uh, I was in no shape to be on the road. I drank uh, Coca-Cola after Coca-Cola. I was a danger on the road. I arrived at the studio one hour before uh, the show was to begin. Uh, there was Tom Weeble, our good friend, and I'm sure you know Tom. Uh, was Indeed, good round of applause. Absolutely, he's here tonight. Was standing by in case I didn't make it. And I, wa- <laughs> and I walked in an hour before showtime. Uh, don't ask me who the guests were. I was in no condition to know even at that time. But my, my brother had said to me, you know, I said to my brother, I called him that evening, he's up in Maine, and I said, you know, this is terrifying experience to go in every day for two different shows and to switch emotional gears in five minutes. You know, one hour you're doing something with hospice workers, the next hour you're doing something about language, you know. And he said, you will be terrified for the first year, but if you stay with it for a year, uh, you will no longer be terrified. And uh, I found that to be true. Do you find, though, that that, um, uh, that concern that you're not going to be able to have the next question in mind, that worry about dead air and, feel, and sounding really, really stupid, uh, <laughs> that that is what keeps you up until 1 o'clock in the morning <laughs> reading that book? I remember many years ago, and I'm not going to mention his name, but a very famous Ohio State University basketball player and I were on together. And we were talking about the possibility of a new sports complex here in uh, Columbus, long before this was anything that could happen. And he and I, he is a very articulate, wonderful guy, and he and I got through, and at the halfway mark, there wasn't a halfway break at that point, Mm -hmm. we looked at one another and we realized that we had said everything we knew. (laughs) Any question I could ask, anything we knew about a sports center. So I looked at him, and I began once again with the first question I had asked. (laughs) And we asked the same questions. He gave the same answers for the second half hour. (laughs) Well, it's interesting. Did it time out? It timed (laughs) out perfectly. (laughs) But but since that, but I've improved since then. (laughs) The um, what about this? Are you going to miss? I'm going to miss uh, just being able to, you know, I'm still, I, I looked in the paper the other day, and I thought, oh, look at this book. Here's an author I'd like to have on the show. Let me talk to Linda Taylor, our producer, and let's get her on the show for June. And then I realized, I don't have a show in June. I don't have that power anymore to get that author on the show. Or, oh, look, here's an issue. I can bring that before the people. I don't have that power anymore. That's what I'm going to miss. I hope to remedy that by podcasts, by occasional appearances. I've got to keep my hand down. I can't let it all go away. Well, retirement is out of the question. Yeah, retirement is out of the question. That's a silly word in a way. It's a word that I think you know, we're all comfortable with, but it's a transition to doing new things. I, you know, you, Neil, you and I have talked before about how a talk show takes over your whole life. Mm. Neil had said to me something that I knew very well. We both agreed, and we mentioned it again today, that our friends keep up with us by listening to the show 
because we don't have the time or energy to be with them in person because you got homework every night. And uh, when you don't have homework, you're flopped in front of a television set, as I did last night watching Foil's War, the old PBS, because you don't have any energy left. So um, that's been a wonderful trade-off for 20 years, I have to tell you. The chance to call up anybody locally or anybody nationally or anybody in the world, uh, the most interesting minds, and say, uh, let's talk. And almost always they agree. Rarely do they say no. It's been a wonderful trade-off. Um, you jettison your family and your friends <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> or, or vice versa. Or, or, or they, yes, vice versa. They jettison you. Uh, so, so it was a wonderful trade-off. And now I'll have a little more time for family and friends. What do you plan to do? Well, I've often said that the last show is uh, Friday, May 29th, right? It's a two-hour open forum, and you're all invited to call in, everybody. And at 2 o'clock that And he's going to hang up on every one of you. <laughs> <laughs> Mm -hmm. I've been wanting to do this for years. <laughs> Just call in and suffer. <laughs> no, we'll be very nice. I understand at 2 o'clock this afternoon there's going to be some sort of presentation, uh, some sort of party at the station, and, and I, I suspect some sort of roast, and uh, I'll have my lines in return and my ammunition ready. And then it'll be a regular weekend. Uh, with my partner Marlene who, who, for of, of some 20 years and we'll do some nice things and maybe we'll go to the art museum or maybe we'll, we'll, we'll walk around down to the river but then Monday morning I'm going to be up in my little office and I'm going to be writing uh, since uh, my great love is writing I'll be writing poetry and I'll be up there Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday maybe I'll try my hand at a novel or a screenplay I've written a play or two, one mm -hmm. of them was a short one which got produced by the Contemporary American Theater Company here so I'll be writing and in the afternoons, I go for long walks along the river and uh, watch the river rats build their nests and watch the great blue herons fly by. And in the afternoon, go visit friends and have a cup of coffee and read the New York Times. Something like that. Sounds like a lot of fun. Hmm. <laughs> the, um, you were kind enough to send me a copy of your, your book when it came out, the yes. poetry book. And I was wondering, uh, poets are sometimes, well, not unlike radio people, eccentric about punctuation. Um, and spelling, if I could spell, I, I wouldn't have to work in radio. <laughs> <laughs> but I, the title of the book, Love Life, and I was wondering, did you mean love life or love life? Oh, both. <laughs> <laughs> I hate him. But, <laughs> but, <laughs> but love life is, is, is the title of the book. There's so many poems in there about nature about walking along. The, the Olden Tangent River is, uh, is, is wonderful to walk along. And if you sit by it for a half hour or so, you really begin to see everything. You know, some people take a walk by the river for just a couple of minutes, and they say, well, we didn't see anything. Well, the animals aren't performing for you. you know? <laughs> but if you stay down there a half hour, you see the blue heron silently winging low across the river. You see the river rat carrying long pieces of, of uh, stuff, straw and grass for her nest. And you see the water snakes swimming along, and it's, it's really lovely. And uh, as you know, I a number of the poems are about that experience. Yes. So. Uh, and it is one of those things that rewards study. The more you know about those animals and their purpose in what they're doing, the more you can understand what they're th doing out there, uh, well, not for your benefit, but for theirs. For this. And it's a whole different world. I mean, uh, when I came to the studio this morning, I knew I was going to interview you in the mm -hmm. morning. I knew I was going to be on Talk of, uh, of the Nation for about 18 minutes, and mm -hmm. I knew we were going to do this tonight. I thought, long day, and I'm nervous. I'm anxious. And as I came into the parking lot, I saw a beautiful blue heron winging its way slowly, very slowly across the parking lot, and I thought, ah, there he is, or there she is, a uh, different kind of life a totally different pace. I don't have to worry about anything, really, and it just calmed me down beautifully. That's a, a lovely thought, and I wonder, though, it was interesting. You said on your first day after driving across the country, you arrived at the studio an hour beforehand. I understand from your people who've worked with you, uh, that's the earliest you've ever shown up for a show. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the crew is applauding in the background, yeah. <laughs> well, I customarily... And Mike Thompson, our news director, has patiently asked me over and over, would I please come at 9.30? And I've tried hard, but generally about two minutes before 10. But then I thought this morning, maybe Neil Conan will get there earlier, and I won't be there to <laughs> greet him. And I thought, maybe I'd better come at 9.30. And so I sat there reading the paper, and I got interested in some stories. And then a long, 
lazy shower, and I looked out the window, and it was a sunny day. And on your honor, Neil, I arrived at nine minutes before ten rather than two to three minutes. <laughs> he didn't know what to do with himself. <laughs> what do you do for two minutes before the show? Uh, but as you know, if, if, if you prepared it the day before and the night before, everything is just fine, and you walk in. And you have the show in your head. You do the show without notes. Well, no, what I have is I write an introduction, a formal introduction to the guest, as I did for you this morning. And I maybe will have 20, 25, or 30 qu questions all written down. Uh, and that's my way of thinking through, uh, you know, the issue, or thinking through your life, as in the case of this morning's show, thinking through what do I want to ask Neil about talk of the nation? What do I want to ask Neil about his life? I may use almost none of them, and as a matter of fact, I don't think I used maybe one, maybe two, maybe the opening question, because your answers took me off in a very, very different direction. It's, it, and th they're there if I need them. And occasionally, if you have a taciturn guest, you need them, and you begin looking down and putting a little star, oh my gosh, I, I, what am I going to say? He, he or she is finishing, and oh, oh, here's a good one, good, very nice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> a taciturn guest is a challenge, uh, so is a guest who uh, is so nervous that they just natter on and on and on, and, and how do you so gently talk to those guests and get them to re-enter your world? Um, we sit very close to one another at the table in the studio, and I kick them. <laughs> uh, under the table, a very sharp, hard kick. Um, no, <laughs> but as you know, we, we, we're both the masters of interruption, I think. And although some people I'm sorry, what would you say? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> the first thing is to listen, Neil. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll work on that. <laughs> so we interrupt, and, and you wait, uh, although as you pointed out earlier today, we, uh, there are those who have... Uh, uh, mastered the art of never breathing. <laughs> it's like a didgeridoo player, you know, from Australia. You, you, you talk on the in-breath and you talk on the out-breath, and I bet you could, we can all think of certain callers, uh, maybe by name, who've mastered <laughs> that. Um, so you learn to interrupt on the in-breath, if you can, and gently guide them back whether it's a caller or whether it's a guest, to what you want them to say. Sometimes, as you know, it's a very difficult thing. You don't want to be... The worst difficulty is a guest who really needs three minutes to make a point. And you hate to be stuck with a guest like that, but occasionally... And if you interrupt earlier, they can legitimately accuse you of, oh. of interrupting their point. But in three minutes, everyone is stupefied. So that is the most difficult sort of guest, and we try to knock them off in the pre-interview. <laughs> <laughs> then there are the people who are the bread and butter of your show, and those are the callers and the emailers, the people who provide the grist. Uh, mm -hmm. And I have always assumed, listening to you, uh, that as on Talk of the Nation, I may have a really good question, but if I have a caller with that question, I'd much rather have the caller ask yeah, the question. Much rather, much rather. Yeah, they're an integral part of the show. We have wonderful callers. Uh, they are articulate. You don't have to say that anymore. You know, you <laughs> let me tell you about the callers. <laughs> <laughs> no, the callers have been wonderful. They are articulate. They are very well informed, and it's embarrassing when... In some cases, they're more well-informed than I am and can correct me. And I don't know if you've had that experience. Oh, from time to time. From time to time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, but there are some callers who tend to ride hobby horses and ride and ride the same hobby horse. And uh, although uh, Rene Bamba, who is our student assistant, who preps them very nicely, uh, sometimes they get on the hobby horse and ride, 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 and it has nothing to do with what I want to say. So then gently you interrupt. And there's a very gentle move to the uh, hold button on the, uh, on the phone console. And if you do it right, no one knows you've done it because it doesn't interrupt. It's, you don't catch them in mid-syllable. And everyone just thinks, oh, they finished their sentence. I mean, it's Forcibly. an odd, odd way to end a thought, but nevertheless. <laughs> odd way to end a thought, but, <laughs> <laughs> but they ended the thought at that point, yeah. There are people who must be regular callers. Sure there are. And you know that someone, uh, 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 Sam uh, from uh, Columbus, is an expert on foreign policy and mm -hmm. likes to call in on those mm -hmm. kinds of shows or uh, different kinds of callers for different kinds of shows. Uh, do you have people who call in every day? We, uh, you know, and I think uh, there's some laughter in the audience because we used to let people call in twice a week and then we realized that certain people were monopolizing, monopolizing that privilege and they are now down to one call every two weeks and everybody's pretty good about dealing with that. But even then, some very prominent callers, people will say, I heard so-and-so on the air every day. Didn't they call in three times this week? No, just, oh. once, <laughs> just once every two weeks. We have some marvelous callers, uh, you know, and, and uh, uh, there's Dave from Powell who... Uh, <laughs> 
Everybody knows that, and you're, you're <laughs> reacting. And I, I think Dave is wonderful. Uh, and I, I fully realize as I'm saying this that this show's gonna be replayed tomorrow and Dave's gonna be listening and he will <laughs> call me in the open forum. Uh, the, in fact, mm -hmm. in some world, the phone is ringing now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But Dave uh, is a wonderful guy, who's, he's but he's never quite learned that the telephone actually amplifies your voice and sends it over a distance. <laughs> you don't have to shout, and he shouts. <laughs> and he is very certain that he is right, with absolutely no evidence, but 50% but of the time he probably turns out to be right. So who does this remind you of? He shouts, he has opinions of which he is very certain, he has no evidence and he's right 50% of the time. Would that be Bill O'Reilly or Keith Olbermann? Which one would that be? <laughs> On alternate days, perhaps. <laughs> On alternate days, yeah. So Dave has a wonderful career in uh, talk television coming up. And the nice thing about him is he has a wonderful sense of humor. Uh, and he's self-effacing. One day I said to him, uh, he said, he called him, Fred, I've had an insight. And I said, well, Dave, where, where did you find that insight? At, at the bottom of a glass? <laughs> And, uh, and he laughed. And then I knew we, I had a conversational partner at that point. It's interesting. Uh, there is another device that sits in both of our control rooms known as the dump button. Oh, yeah. And in the old days, Fred and I are both old enough to remember when tape recorders uh, were the medium of uh, broadcast uh, or playback at, at uh, radio stations around the country. And I used to understand the seven-second delay because there would be uh, two... Ampexers or scullies next to each other, and the supply reel would go here, and it, the signal would record on this, the head of this machine, and then play back over on the head of this machine. And mm -hmm. I, I understood this. And now there are these digital devices that somehow steal nanoseconds for the first five minutes of the program. Yeah. And then it says all of a sudden in Spanish, on delay. <laughs> <laughs> then if somebody says something they're not supposed to say on a radio station in this country, uh, you hit the dump button, and suddenly that time goes, where? I always imagine this little Einsteinian universe that's filled <laughs> with little 10-second bubbles of dirty words. Yeah. <laughs> well, Neil, it's there, and I have visited that <laughs> land and uh, in my personal life every day. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely there. You know, I've never had, I must say that our call is a wonderful, I've never had to use the dump button. Never? It's, never, never. It's there. We've had it, I think, maybe about a year, a year and a half, and before that, we went out live for like 18 and a half years. Mm -hmm. On w one, maybe two occasions that I can remember, the F word was used. Once by a caller who was very sincere and just very upset with one of the guests I had, and I thought she said that word with vigor and sincerity. <laughs> And so I didn't chastise her, and she apologized immediately, and we went on. The second time that word was used was by, by a dictionary editor. Uh, Random House Dictionaries put out a small paperback dictionary called the F Word, and it was a scholarly work, and it was every combination of the F Word that you can think of, noun, verb, adjective, adverb, preposition, conjunction, and interjection. So I thought, let's do a half hour on that with mm -hmm. Jesse... <laughs> <laughs> with Jesse Scheidlauer, the editor at that point of Random House Dictionaries, right? And so we took elaborate precautions to screen the calls very carefully because we didn't have a 12-second delay. We had no delay. And the listeners were right. Unfortunately, Jesse, who, uh, who was very used to dealing with the word on a scholarly basis, articulated the word right in the middle of the show. Um, two things happened. He apologized profusely, which I was delighted to hear. And we got a wonderful article in the Columbus Dispatch, which is sort of a human interest kind of article. Mm -hmm. The word had been said. Um, but our callers are wonderful, and, and they've, rarely, they've rarely done anything like that. It's, uh, it's an extraordinary moment, though. Doesn't it send a little uh, surge of adrenaline through your, through your heart? Surge of something. <laughs> uh, you, you, you just don't know what to say. I, I do remember, and I, and I re really regret this. A caller came on and said, uh, on another occasion, a few choice not words, not the F word. And I hung up on them, and I, and I said to him, un from under which rock, rock did you crawl? And I <laughs> said, go back. And, I, and I, this is early out on the show, and I really regretted that later. I sort of should have said something stronger, I think. No. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't enough. I'm sorry. <laughs> Well, that raises another issue, which is how do you think you have grown as a host uh, on Open Line all these years? I think that, um, well, I, I think of doing a show, uh, as we both do, it, it's a journalistic art, for one thing. You want to be accurate. You want to be certain you're correct. That's the first thing, accuracy. 
The second thing, I think of it as sort of, theatri of a theatrical performance, a bit of a, a drama almost. I want to keep people entertained and interested in, and, and buy their radios. My, my grandfather was a Shakespearean actor hmm. uh, in the early teens, Otto F. Anderley, and he was in Shakespearean plays around the country under that name. So I think of myself uh, as carrying on his tradition uh, on another kind of a stage, on a different kind of stage, uh, electronic stage. So I'm very aware of, of how interested am I in this interview at this moment. And if I ever find myself drifting, I'm immediately back with a question. I go to my gut and I say, what is the question that I want to ask Neil right now? Mm -hmm. What is it that I want to say? What do I really care about with this speaker, with this guest? And if I get away from that, uh, then I start to slack off. And I'm sure the audience does as well. So I bring myself back. So I've learned that um, I must be totally present and I must be very interested. And generally, I can, can very much do that. Mm -hmm. A nice scholarly answer, but it doesn't really answer the question. Ask it again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I will ask it in a different way. Yeah. We all work in this business mm -hmm. with, I think, three instruments. With our brains, mm -hmm. and you've talked a little bit about the training that was involved or the random acts of life that have gone to create the experiences on which you draw. And we react with our hearts. But we also use another instrument, which is our voice. Mm -hmm. And that is... Uh, I wonder, you mentioned your father being an actor. Grandfather, do you, yeah. Uh, do, do, you, uh, do you think you've gotten that skill from him? Oh, absolutely. My grandfather, who I never met because he died before I was born, mm -hmm. uh, I have uh, some of his memorabilia, his photo as Iago in Othello, and, um, and his sword from when he played in sword and sorcery kind of, kind of, kind of plays. Um, I think the ability comes directly from him, absolutely. Uh, I think of him sometimes before going on, and I did this tonight. I'll, I'll talk to him, and I'll say, Granddad, uh, I'm a little nervous tonight. I'm a little out of, uh, of energy. Uh, give, me, give me a little push here, if, if you would, from the other side. And, may, and I think maybe he's listening. <laughs> yeah, he seems to help. And another part of it is we operate on the voice that we hear in our heads or heard in our heads when we were kids listening to the radio. Mm -hmm. Who did you listen to growing up? Oh. Who impressed you? When I was a kid, what I did, I thought I wanted to be a disc jockey. And I listened to all the top 40 stations. And my father always said, why are you wasting all your time listening to the radio? <laughs> <laughs> he really saw no benefit in this whatsoever. But I thought about them, and I imitated them, and the disc jockeys, as it turned out, were my heroes. And later on, of course, as soon as I heard a talk show, I wanted to do one. Nobody ever gave me this opportunity. Uh, they didn't trust me somehow. Whose talk show did you hear first? Well, there's a local radio station. Well, I'll, t I'll tell you. Jake, Jack Eigen had a, had a talk show from the Shea Puri in Chicago late at night. And I used to listen, bring the little transistor radio into the bed under the covers, you uh -huh. know, turn out the lights. And there's Jack Eigen. Very sophisticated presentation, you know, you know the, the top uh, sophisticated people in Chicago there at the nightclub at the Shea Puri. It was probably nonsense, you know, but, <laughs> but I, as a 12-year-old, you know, a a thought this was wonderful stuff. So he was the first one to impress me. Barry Farber from New York sure, yeah. uh, used to come in on one of our local radio stations. They carried him syndicated, and I thought he was really good indeed. So those are some of the early voices. Uh, you know, Gene Shepard with his monologues from WOR in New York, those wonderful monologues, not a talk show, but the wonderful monologues that he did. And somehow I knew I always wanted to get in front of a microphone and be on radio. And when was the first time you achieved that ambition? Uh, the first time uh, there was a uh, television station in Buffalo, which is where I grew up, WNED-TV. It's the public television station. And they said, you can come and be the booth announcer. Hmm. There were live booth announcers. And all the booth announcer would say when you got the cue and the little light went on, and you may remember this, Neil, this is WNED-TV, Channel 17 in Buffalo. Off, gone. Right. That was my first chance. <laughs> now, I, I think they actually, you have to go like this. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you do. And of course, you were wearing a tuxedo. Oh, always. <laughs> <laughs> I was told about a game that, that, that the announcers at NBC in New York did when they got bored in the early days of radio uh, in Rockefeller Center. They would take elevators up and down, calculating what floor they had to punch and what time they had to be back for a live break. This must have been in the 30s or the 40s to scoot into the studio just in time to say, this is the National Broadcasting Company. And apparently they were so skilled at elevator movements that they did it every time. This orchestration, they never failed? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and when was the most, uh, given that, uh, when did you arrive at the studio the latest before you got on the air? Oh, well, um, I remember one day, it was last winter, 
And my car, which I had always depended on to get out of ice, would not be moved from the ice. It was iced in. So it was like seven minutes to 10 o'clock. And a wonderful neighbor whose name is Eric saw me struggling to get the car out of the ice. I had given up. I was going to call in and say, forget it. I I can't get in today. He got his car and he said, I'll take you. And I got in at, uh, I'd say, four seconds running down to the studio. I was so out of breath. If you've ever been in that situation, you think you can talk, but you can't. You're out of breath. Totally out of breath. So I just got on mic and I laughed. And I said, look. (laughs) I'm out of breath. I'm sorry. I just ran in. Thanks to my neighbor, Eric. I couldn't get the car out of the ice. And our guest the first hour, pant, 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 is so-and-so. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think this is my opportunity to say, uh, Fred, we have to take a short break. So do. bear with us. Uh, Fred Anderley on the Open Line Show. Yeah. On Talk of the Nation, we'd like to be clear about Who's what that? we're talking about. Who is that? Movies. The B movie was a movie that was made specifically to be on the bottom half of a double feature. Or the auto industry. One mid-level executive at a top. This gives you an opportunity to say that, by the way, after ago, the show, there are some folks here I'd like to recognize. Um, uh, some of our staff behind the scenes. So if you want to hang around a little bit, just after Neil and I finish, I'd like to call on them to stand up and, and, and be recognized. I don't see them, but I suspect I know they're here somewhere. You can get the latest information from and some of our regular guests as well I've seen tonight, too. So. or monthly, it's your choice with the WOSU FYI e-newsletter. To get it, just go to WOSU.org slash email and sign up today. This is Terry Gross, and I have about 15... And we're going to take questions from the audience in the second half, so if anybody wants to get in line in front of that microphone, here's your opportunity. Sure. Hit me with your best shot. Yeah. We can edit it before it airs. Again, you're showing your age, Fred. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really. Are we about the same age? I think so. Almost. Yeah. at noon on WOSU. Notice neither one of us said what it was. <laughs> we're both in our late 40s. <laughs> Support for WOSU is provided by Germain Cadillac. And that's of just Easton our waste circumference. Cadillac that's of uh, Dublin, a source for Cadillac. I have to spend all that Ohio, time every morning working the white the into our ears. Cadillac CTS. <laughs> yeah, More so information tough. at germaincadillac.com. This is Neil Conan from NPR's Talk of the Nation, filling in today with an unusual guest on Open Line. Fred Anderley is with us, and we're celebrating his more than 20 years here on WOSU. And, uh, Fred, this is an opportunity uh, we've had. You've taken calls from listeners and mm-hmm. emails from listeners. I, I assume you took faxes from listeners at some point. Nevertheless, this is an opportunity for those gathered here at the Battelle Center at WOSU at COSI to uh, ask you the questions sure. for a change. So sure. we're going to provide an opportunity. Just come to the microphone here in the center of the room and fire away. Go Our ahead. Our first uh, person here is Bob, who I recognize. Hello, Bob. Hi. Hi, Fred. Fred, uh, your show is an integral part of the democratic process or project that still is unfolding. Like, um, people have to be able to talk to each other to have democracy happen. I wonder whether you can tell us what your feelings are about the future of the Democratic Project based on how we're talking to each other now. Do you think people listen to the premises that the other persons are speaking to? For example, I don't ever listen to O'Reilly, and I do listen to... Uh, I never turned Fox on, in fact, and I, but I always no. say, but at MSNBC, I do like uh, Keith Olbermann, and I'm sure that I'm related to people, and I run into them all the time that are just the other way, and so we, at fundamental levels, I don't see that we're getting anywhere. Should, well, am I too pessimistic is my question. Well, I, it's, a, it's a very good question. I, I always love to have a guest on the show with whom I disagree. Mm. You know, I, I, I love to talk with people who I disagree with. Not that at the end of that conversation I'll necessarily be convinced that they are correct. I mean, I, I may think that their views are very damaging or to, to the republic, but I learned something. Uh, my mind is broadened. I must stop and listen. And if that other person, even if I thoroughly disagree with them, if I think they've come to their conclusions through a process of care and concern and thought, 
then I'm going to respect them and I'm going to give them that respect. And even if they haven't taken the care and concern and thought, and even if they've gotten their views wholesale from Bill O'Reilly or Keith Olbermann, whichever side of the spectrum you are, that's okay too. They've taken the time to call in. I want to hear them with respect, and then I want to question their position. I especially want to question their position, however, if I agree with them privately. Mm -hmm. I want to give them a harder time. But I think... uh, Bob, the answer to the question is I hope we talk to each other more um, and hope we talk to each other civilly. And I think Neil's show, Talk of the Nation, and, and my show, which will continue you know, with another host, I, I think, uh, and, and public radio in general is where we have uh, discussions that are civil, where we do care, where we do want to listen to opposing opinions. Because every once in a while I hear an opposing opinion, I just abridge mine a little bit. If I get too wedded to my opinions, uh, that can be pretty awful. Because the basis for me is underneath all our opinions, and we may radically disagree, we're all the same. We all want to live a happy life. We all want the best for our families. We want the best for our communities. We want a peaceful life. Uh, we, want, we want the good. So that's the commonality. That's the human commonality. And so if I can get to that point with a caller or with anybody, we're going. And, and that caller and I can work together, and we can feel we respect one another. And that's the kind of dialogue I think we should continue on the air and off the air both. Yeah. yeah. You, you gave two answers. One of them was that you felt you needed to be able to think and respect them. And, but when you closed, you said that you were both in that mutually respecting mode. Yeah, hopefully. That's two different answers, though. Yeah. Uh-huh, a critic. <laughs> Everybody's an editor. <laughs> I won't be a critic. And our next speaker is Anne. Hello, Anne. Hi, Fred. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for so many years of wonderful learning is the way I look at the program. Um, but I wondered, you mentioned a couple of people who had been sort of mentors to you out there being talk show hosts. Uh, first, whether Terry Gross had been uh, influential in your technique and so forth. Uh, she's um, certainly been uh, a major yeah. contributor to Oh, absolutely. NPR. She's a marvelous interviewer, and she influenced me. I, a long time ago, I read an article about her when she was not married, and, and, and uh, she was going with her now husband. And, and The article in the American Journalism Review said um, Terry takes uh, books and, and tapes and CDs home with her and prepares all evening and talks only to her boyfriend by telephone, and they only see each other on the weekend. Mm-hmm. And she's a marvelous uh, worker in that regard. And, of course, it shows... In, in the kind of astute questions that she asks. So I got three things from Terry, I think. Number one, uh, the, the hard work, you know, and I don't work as hard ever as, as she did. I, I couldn't do that. Uh, number two, the astute questions which leave her in the background. The show's not about about Terry it's, and Neil. I think you'll agree it's not mm-hmm. about Neil. It's, it's about the guest. It's about the issue, and I learned all that from her. Yeah. Well, I, I think for myself that I think what I see as a commonality is that you listen and that when the guest says something that might provoke another question, instead of going to a set question, you follow up on it. And both of you have that gift. Um, But I also wanted to ask you um, whether you could talk a bit about your favorite themes for programs. Themes for programs. Uh, Oh, I love um, the great issues of the day. Uh, issues of war and peace. I uh, had Andrew Basevich on just the other day. He's a professor of history at, uh, at Boston University, and he's been a critic of all of our wars in the 20th, just about all of them except World War II, I would think, in the 20th and 21st century. He's conservative, uh, but, a, but a certain kind of conservative who says, who says, do we really need an empire? He thinks we have a soft empire, he calls it. Well, agreeing with that statement or disagreeing with it, uh, it was wonderful to have him on the air because I wanted to hear it. I wanted to hear something a little different. It's very sad. He lost his son in the war in Iraq. His son died in, in combat in Iraq, and it, it's, um, it was a difficult interview in that sense. We didn't talk about it, but it, it loomed in, in the background. I love anybody who gives me a contrary point of view. I love talking to Tim Graham from the Media Research Center. He's been a regular guest. It's a conservative media watchdog center. He's been a regular guest on the show for a number of years, and he always challenges me. And some of the listeners really don't like him. (laughs) And and that's always good. Listeners, be civil. You know, Tim's a really, really good guy, a very sincere uh, conservative. And the same with Norman Solomon, you know, who is the the liberal equivalent, you know, of of Tim Graham and operates uh, with extra, the, the liberal. Uh, media uh, situation. So, uh, you know, politics, social issues, issues of, uh, 
uh, concern for poverty in the United States. I mean, we're such a wealthy country, and so many people are in, in poverty. And I always wonder why, well, we care, but maybe we don't care sufficiently. Why don't people have medical care? You know, why don't people have the best health care, all of us, when they do in every other European country, uh, in every Western industrialized country? Why do we neglect people in poverty? Um, I'm interested in the answers to, to those questions. I think I'm also I- interested in what I guess you could loosely call spiritual issues. Mm-hmm. We had Andrew Bart Schmuckler on today, and, and we talked about uh, what do you know, the listener, in your life about being happy? What have you learned about how to be happy? So anybody who can help me with being happy, I always appreciate it. I'd like to be happier and happier. Uh, who has figured out the ultimate meaning of life. I want them on the show. Mm. Thomas Mork, you know, author of Care of the Soul, is going to be my last formal guest on Thursday the 28th, right after the mayor does the first hour. I'm really interested in what he has to say. He has a new book in which he talks about Jesus as a model for everybody of whatever religion or belief or non-belief. So I'm finding that very fascinating. So those issues I love as well. You think he's going to be more spiritual than the mayor? <laughs> I... Uh, <laughs> The mayor's wonderful, but no comment. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go back to the microphone here. Um, just first, thanks. Second, nice beards. Ah, thanks. Right. Yeah, nice. And you as well. It's, uh, <laughs> you know, it's interesting because up until recently, I, wouldn't, I would pass you on the street and I wouldn't even know who you are. Now, your voice, yeah, kick on yeah. that real quick. Um, the knowledge that you impart over the radio what about going on Jeopardy or something like that? <laughs> I would, th- you know, have you ever thought about that? I sit and watch Jeopardy at night when I'm not watching Entertainment Tonight to know what the stars are doing when I'm not watching that. You know, I'll tune over to Jeopardy, and I fail miserably. Really? <laughs> I'm not. I'm not a good person at the at the, at the individual fact. You know, at the trivia. Some it depends on the category. Sometimes I do well. A friend of mine won forty thousand dollars on on Jeopardy, and I might be able to do that. Maybe I'll maybe I'll take you up on that. I think Fred ought to hold out for Celebrity Jeopardy. There you go. Because <laughs> then, the Entertainment Tonight part will come in handy too. <laughs> In 20 years, who was your most entertaining guest? And second question, who was your most annoying guest? Oh, and please don't include excluded. my name <laughs> in the answer to the second question. Would you name it? I will not, I will not include your name as <laughs> a prominent you. animal welfare activist. No, you were just great. Uh, by the way, that's another issue that I really enjoy talking about, how we treat animals in our society and the disjunction between how we treat the animals uh, who are in our household on whom we may spend $1,000 for care because we really care about them, and the way farm animals are treated like things and like objects, and I'm very interested to know why we, why we do that. I don't know. I don't understand that. Um, uh, my most annoying guest comes to mind very quickly <laughs> because they're sitting right in the audience. No, they're, they're not really. Um, it was an unnamed philosophy professor, not from Ohio State University or anywhere around here, who came on the show, he'd written a philosophy textbook, textbook, and I would say to him, tell me about the Roman emperor, the philosopher Marcus Aurelius, who, who talked about our, our thoughts, by our thoughts we form our lives. Tell me more about that. And he, and he would say, well, Marcus Aurelius d- didn't really say that. He, uh, he said really something else, and I'm not sure what that is right now. <laughs> and then I went to another philosopher. Well, tell me about Descartes. Descartes said the following. Uh, well, he didn't quite say that. Let me think. Uh, no, the, he said something different. And it was like whack-a-mole. You know, here he is. <laughs> now he's over here. Now he's over here. I couldn't get them to give me a straight answer. And at the half-hour mark, he was scheduled. One thing you can always do, Larry King always says, you can open the phones and go to the audience, exactly. right? Exactly, when in doubt. And at the half-hour, I said bye-bye, and, uh, and, and, and off we went to the audience. Um, My husband is a philosophy professor for 25 years at Ohio State. And he's the guy, no. (laughs) I'm sure he's very different. (laughs) Well, I I don't know if there's that particular. I I remember um, the most fun I had with a guest consistently. Maybe some of you remember Julia Keller, who was the television critic for uh, the Columbus Dispatch, and she now is the Pulitzer Prize winning uh, culture writer for the Chicago Tribune. We always had the most fun. We just kidded, kidded each other, you know, mer- unmercifully, you know, from, from, from <laughs> front to back. Uh, the show I remember as being um, most moving, I think, was um, I did a show with hospice workers locally, and when we talked about the, passages, uh, the, the passage of dying and moving through um, Some people called in whom these particular hospice workers had helped uh, pass through into their death and whatever awaits them on the other side. 
Uh, and uh, that was just extraordinary. I don't know if you've ever had this, Neil, but there, there could be a point coming in the show when I, I'm, I'm trying to say something, and I'm so moved, I almost can't say it. Uh, and there's a moment of silence while I just sort of try to collect myself. And, and that happened during that show. Hmm. Thank you for 20 years. Oh, thank you, Richie. <laughs> <laughs> And this is Eugene. Hi, Eugene. Hey, Eugene good is evening, the guy Fred. you hear on a Halloween evening, maybe in your neighborhood with his piano on his bicycle, his keyboard on his bicycle, <laughs> playing spooky Halloween tunes. Do you know? All through the neighborhood, that's Eugene. <laughs> Fred, you know, I've, I've often seen you walk along the river, and I always thought, gee, this guy has time to walk every day. He must be winging his show. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever had to do that, wing your show, and also... How much time do you typically prepare, take to prepare, and when do you know that you've prepared enough? Um, Neil and I were talking about this earlier with, yeah. with, with regard to books. Let's say if it's a question of a book. Um, the easiest book to read, and you can't read it cover to cover because there's no time to do that. I can't at least. Sometimes I'll have three or four books a week, although we've limited that now recently uh, to two. Um, I, there's a certain point in reading a book you know, in, in which you you say, I've got it, you know. And it may be after one hour, it may be two hours, it may be three hours. The most difficult book for me to prepare is one that's a history because it's discrete incidents. Benjamin Franklin did this and he went to Paris and this happened. If it's a book on gun control and it's a thesis right. that the author has, I kind of know the issue of gun control and I'm, I can maybe get the thesis after. The marvelous book is the one that gives you the whole book in a 20-page introduction and the rest of the book is filler. And believe me, there are a lot of books like that. <laughs> so that's, that's the most marvelous kind you have. But the most difficult is a history, a history of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, you know, and all these things I don't know. And you spend many hours, and that's that midnight and 1 o'clock in the morning that we both, we both talk about. Did I ever have to wing it? No, not, in, not unless, uh, oh, well, you know, when a guest um, doesn't appear on the other end of the phone, you call them and they're not there. Uh, you checked with them the day before. You knew they were supposed to be there. Well, this has happened a couple of times. In one case, the fellow had been taken to the hospital uh, and was legitimately in the hospital. So all my curses fell on deaf ears because uh, he really couldn't be there. The strangest thing that ever happened was I had a fellow who had written a book about Iraq and about the insur- he had spent time with the insurgents in Iraq, a very interesting book. And I called him up this time. I got there early because he, he, I knew he was overseas. So I called him at before 10 o'clock, and he said, oh, hi, and you know, I'm here. He said, but I'm on a cell phone. I'm in Italy, and, and, I, and I can't find out. You, you try not to do a show on a cell phone because they're not reliable. And I can't find a, a landline, and I thought, you mean you're in Italy? There are, no, there are no landlines in Italy? I mean, you must be able to. Anyway, but I said, fine, we'll, we'll do it on the cell phone. I'll call you back at two minutes after 10 o'clock, whatever time it was in Italy, 5 o'clock. I called him back at two minutes past 10, and he was gone. And I just got his voicemail, and we called... Uh, more and more plaintively as uh, the next few minutes moved on. And he, we never discovered what happened to him. His uh, publisher never discovered when she wrote him. His publicist never discovered. So in, in that case, it becomes open phones. And in an open phone segment, you've got to be ready to add. You, you present three or four topics you think people might want to call in on. Mm-hmm. And, and maybe you, uh, you may, maybe you'd be ready to talk for, oh, at least 10 or 15 minutes to discourse on those issues. And the longest I've ever had to speak, I think, on a bad day was 25 minutes when nobody called in. But that's very rare. <laughs> so you wing it with open phones. <laughs> Thank you, Fred. I'll see you along the river. See you along the river. Bring your piano keyboard. <laughs> <laughs> Please come up to the microphone. Um, Fred, we know about your love of nature and walking along the Olentangy, but I wonder if you have any plans to do any international travel, and if so, what kinds of um, destinations might appeal to you? Well, uh, we've recently done some international travel. My partner, Marlene, who is sitting right there, and I, uh, we went to see Marlene's son in uh, China, in Shekou, in Shenzhen province, where he's working. He's, He's a nurse, and he runs a clinic. And then we went over to Thailand for a little while. Marlene just got back from Okinawa. I was too exhausted to go, for, but I, it would have been nice to see Okinawa and Bali with her. We'll be able to do more of that together. So there will be some international travel. There is a, a postal boat, a mail boat, that goes up the coast of Labrador to all the little fishing villages. Uh, it's the only way you can get to some of these villages. I hope the villages are still there because the cod banks have been fished out, but they were 20 years ago. I want to book passage on that postal boat, and I want to go into those villages in the early morning dawn you know, and see the sunrise over those Labrador villages. I recommend summertime. 
Yes, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. If you fly over Labrador, which I have, it's mostly the, the, the capital city is a dual city, Happy Valley Goose Bay. Uh, it's a tiny little city. And um, I once wanted to journey into Labrador, but they told me after 50 miles you needed four-wheel drive, and I didn't have it. I was in Newfoundland. Uh, so next time it's the postal boat, yeah. Hmm. <laughs> Thank you for your questions. Uh, we appreciate it. Um, what have you learned? Oh, my gosh. Lots. I mean, I mean, in terms of subject matter, I mean, so much. But, but there's something more to learn than subject matter. Um, I've learned to be a lot more patient uh, with, with callers, with the guests, and in my personal life. Um, I hope I've learned to be a little more compassionate with people who get on my nerves and push my buttons. <laughs> <You know? laughs> we all have people you know, who just push our buttons. There's something about them and so something about the way they... And I've had one or two callers over the years who have gotten to me that way. And initially I was, I'm, I'm sorry to say, fairly rude. But over time, uh, I, I've moved into a position where I, I could... I could try to at least be civil. <laughs> if I, you know how it is when somebody pushes your buttons, they just have the key to your heart or your liver or something, and they get you every time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I hope, I, hope um, I think the most important thing about life, and it's taken me a very long time to learn this, is that we, I mean decades, is that we only have this moment. This is all we've got. Uh, I mean, later tonight I'll be putting down food for the cat, and, and you'll be uh, packing up to go to New York, uh, and we, all we'll have of this moment is memory. It's just in our memory. It won't exist anywhere else. So what we have is this moment, and I've learned, I think, through the show and through other experiences to, to try to be fully present in the moment. Not an easy thing to do. Uh, and I think Aldous Huxley, you know, the great philosopher, said when he was on his deathbed, uh, as you look back on your life, w w is there anything you'd do differently? And he said, well, I hope I would have been a little kinder. Uh, and I think, wow, I think that uh, being kind to oneself, first of all, <laughs> <laughs> first of all to yourself, and secondly to everybody else, even in, a, in just a momentary, we're only here for a very short time, even if we live to be 95 or 100 years old, we're only here for a very short time, so why not be kind to one another in the meantime, every chance we get, even if it's just a quick hello, if that's all you have time for, for the postman or the, or the store clerk, why not be kind to one another, and, and start, we start by being kind to ourselves and move out, I think, in part. Um, It's sometimes said that as we look back on our lives, very few of us will say, you know, gee, I wish I'd worked a little harder. <laughs> Yet, I find myself wishing I had worked harder at times. Hmm. And I wonder if you think the time you have spent all those evenings reading those books, all that time doing your homework, getting ready for the show, that preparation... Do you wish you'd been doing other things? No, no. It was a wonderful time, uh, a little more th than 20 years. I don't wish. I never thought, gee, I wish I was out you know, at the concert or I wish I was walking along the river. I'll do that on the weekend. I mean, a friend of mine said, I'm I mean, repeating myself a little bit, he said, you've got the best job in the world. Your job is to call up the most interesting people in the world and talk to them. What a great job, and your job too. Sure. And what a great job description. I never resented that. I mean, there were some evenings and I thought, I don't want to do this. It's 10 o'clock at night. I've got to go book, back to reading this book about Benjamin Franklin. I'm much more interested in Thomas Jefferson. I don't care about <laughs> Benjamin Franklin. I don't want to do this. And I just railed at it, you know. And there are those times uh, that you just, you know, you just, you're lazy. You just you just don't want to do it. Uh, but overall, it's been a, it's been a marvelous experience. I wouldn't trade it for anything. I feel so fortunate. We also have. You mentioned uh, we'll only have memories of those moments for the yeah. most part. Yet two hours of your day, five days a week, or lately four, but most mm -hmm. of your life uh, last twenty yeah. years, five days a week. Uh, two hours of every day is uh, it's preserved. Yeah. Do you ever go back and listen? Not yet. Uh, but I will, because I was thinking as I was cleaning out my office the other day, because you do that a little bit in advance, and I was thinking, well, what are the memories I'm going to have? You know, here is maybe one of the, the uh, 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 a very nice award that I got, a piece of paper or, or a little plaque, and, and very nice. But in the end, I remember reading a book about Muhammad Ali, the, the, the wonderful uh, fighter, you know, just a, a great person, I think. And, and, and they went to his house, and he was surrounded, you know, all his trophies and his championship belt, but... 
I thought, you know, am I going to just be surrounded by trophies and championship <laughs> belts? You know, <laughs> that's uh, how do you preserve the memory of 20 years? And I don't know how you do that. One way, I'll have some of the shows on CD and I'll listen to them occasionally, but I don't know. Have you figured that out? How do you preserve the memory of 20 years? How do you make it real to yourself after you leave? I don't know. Uh, me neither, but I know we have time for one more question. There we go. Fred, thank you uh, for, for your time. Um, the, the segue into the question I have to ask is, uh, um, Gandhi was one to, once asked what kind of message he had for the people of India at some point, and as he was leaving the venue, he said, my life is my message. And I wonder, as you reflect on your life professionally to this point, uh, do you have a sense of what that answer might be if you were to answer that question? If somebody asked me what my message for... Yeah, what is the message of your life? Ah, I'm going to borrow the words of um, uh, Matthew Fox, who was a, a, a Roman Catholic theologian, uh, who said he thought the purpose of life was to love life first and seek justice for others. I think that's it. I think... I think I, I can only speak for myself. First of all, I, I want to try to cultivate my love of life. I want to have a good time. I want to relax. I want to enjoy my friends and my family. Uh, and then I want to use, because I'm so privileged, and we all here are so privileged. I'm, I'm privileged economically. I'm privileged to have had this microphone. I've got communication skills. I want to help seek justice for others. Uh, you know, by presenting in interviews, and if I continue to do some interviews on podcasts, which I hope I will over time after I take the summer off, I want to... I, I want to try and present guests whose mission is to seek justice for others. And in presenting that guest, maybe hope that some people will hear that message. I mean, it's not up to me to carry the message. I, I'm, I'm the neutral carrier of the message. But I can select guests who have a message of justice for others. And I, I think he said it really, really well. I think you've been a good role model for that. So thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> And still, and still the neutral messenger, you're not going to take the advantage of leaving the shackles of journalism behind <laughs> and being for <laughs> and against? <laughs> you know, being for and against is so commonplace. <laughs> there are so many people out there who are for and against, and I'm happy to sit back and ask another person, the guest, what are you for? What are you against? Let's have a dialogue, yeah. Hmm. What about you? When you? I can't imagine you ever leaving Talk of the Nation, but when you do, will you want to leave the shackles of journalism? I was lucky enough to do a play-by-play -play for a minor league baseball team for a while, and it was really good to be for them. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> One quick last question. Um, uh, Adam Fred, uh, it's been great to uh, see and hear you. Um, my question uh, that I've been dying to know, Neil, what made you come? What, what made me what come? I, I, I thought that would be a cool wrap-up. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. Producer. Um, <laughs> Fred and other broadcasters around the country uh, like him have been the glue that holds the public radio system together. Uh, we in Washington, D.C. are fortunate to be able to borrow their microphones from time to time and broadcast on their stations and uh, reach out to you, the people who uh, they have helped bring uh, to this dialogue and have helped train uh, to ask such good questions and to be such great interlocutors. I'm always sure that if I get a caller from Columbus, it's going to be a good question and it's going to be a civil question hmm. because they don't want to get Fred mad. <laughs> <laughs> Fred is uh, really important to all of us in Washington, D.C. He's been exceptionally kind to us when we've been uh, here in Columbus and in some small way I wanted to return the favor. And Fred, I guess, you know, that one of the last things that we can say is I know that uh, when you first got here, that first day after driving all that way on your visit to California, well, it was a temporary job. I thought it was a couple of, uh, I thought it was six weeks filling in until they found a permanent host and it was, seemed like a good fit. And uh, I, I think what has happened since is you have made that slot forever yours. It's going to be difficult. I know you've got a wonderful host who's coming in, uh, a temp uh, to fill in, mm -hmm, for uh, and yeah. she, may, uh, she may take it over and do it for the next 40 years. Yeah. Uh, but open line, it's always going to be Fred Anderley's show. Thanks so much, Neil. Fred, thank you. And thank you, Neil. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> Thanks again.
Thank you so much. Thank you so much for listening and being such a wonderful audience and wonderful caller-inners over the years. Thanks so much. Neil, thank you for your graciousness on air and off the air as well. I want you to know how gracious a person Neil is. We have 25 seconds, huh? Is that right? Not according to that clock. We're fit. What do we have? Are we're we cool. I think we're done. We're done. <laughs> okay. Well, this is WOSU. A20 Columbus. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have three minutes to kill here. What would you like to do? <laughs> did you bring the cards? I did. Okay. <laughs> I was once uh, being made up uh, for a television appearance, and the uh, makeup artist wanted to know what I, I usually use on my hair. <laughs> and I replied, headphones. <laughs> <laughs> and this is one of those broadcasts where I'm not actually sure we need them. Yeah, why would we? Why would we? We There's hear no callers clearly, and uh, I can hear you from there. I think so. We'll move them on. I off. think we're going to be able to hear any of the uh, questioners who may uh, want to come up to the microphone later. By the way, if you ask me a question, I'm not answering. It's about him tonight. <laughs> you can make. You can ask embarrassing questions. You can ask uh, serious questions, amusing questions, uh, any kind of question at all. Right. Mm-hmm. And if it's sufficiently embarrassing, I'll ask Neil to step forward. <laughs> <laughs> looks like we have about 40 seconds. Including providing counseling to the victims, some of whom are now in their Remember the Beatles movie, The Yellow Argentina Submarine, where they counted you down? Luxury Each second seems so long. Each second was a new animation. That's a lovely quarter. movie. Company says revenues for its most recent We're just revealing our age, that was Yeah. <laughs> some of you may not remember that movie. First sales figures. I'm Jack Sphere, NPR News in Washington. A farewell tribute to Open Line's Fred Anderley on the Columbus Collaborative is a production of WOSU Public Media.